silent disco with our, with our AirPods. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. So I'll call this meeting to order and I'll turn it over to um, <laughs> interim assistant city manager, um, Kaki Demick. Good evening. Um, just uh, some background. Um, this uh, work session came out of um, the uh, council meeting in January. That seems like it's really loud. It's not too loud. I think uh, they put their door up because you have too far, so they might turn it down if it's closer to Okay. You. That's my advice. Okay. <laughs> January 22nd. <laughs> um, January 22nd, in which um, some recommendations for a resolution were presented and the council requested additional information. Um, so our uh, draft agenda, because we can um, change it and add things, um, if you like, we do have some information we'd like to present to you based on your request for information. Um, uh, but we can add or subtract things as well. Um, but we did allow for public comment to the beginning and at the end. So I did not do a sign-up sheet okay. because I did not anticipate hordes. Hordes. Hordes of peoples. All right. So is there anyone who would like to speak? Well, so for people at home, yes. yeah. Oh, you're, yeah, gosh, gotcha. true. Okay, um, Walt Tiny, I'm a um, city resident. Um, uh, I appreciate all the hard work that's gone into this um, process so far. Um, and I want to say, um, just from the get-go, that um, there are many, many fine nonprofits that are operating in this town and are doing really good work. I see some of the people that I know from some of those nonprofits who are doing that kind of work. Um, I've read through the slides and just a couple of quick comments and maybe some at the end. Um, but I really think at this point um, that uh, the, this process needs a really strong external review um, from an independent outside source with some skills that have some multicultural um, evaluation um, uh, expertise. Um, I'd say yes to all of the ABRT work group recommendations. I read them on the sheet here. They're all perfect. I don't know. From my point of view, what are we waiting for? Mm -hmm. um, I think those that study group did an excellent job, um, and those recommendations I think are right on the money. Um, I do think that we need more data than the CNE and the city survey. I don't think that quite gets at the problem from the point of view of recipients of services who are oftentimes oftentimes reticent to come out and fill out surveys. Um, or to come out um, and speak publicly about their particular experiences with uh, nonprofit and city services. Um, so I really think at some point we need to have um, some discussion about having a better independent review of the data that's already been collected um, and maybe uh, a way maybe a way to um, to uh, measure the implementation of any new process that you all come up with as you start making changes. Um, I think that uh, independent review should have access to all CNE and city data, um, and we really need to focus in on client satisfaction, um, especially com the community concerns with access and engagement for communities of color and a low wealth. Um, on page nine of here, you have some recommendations from um, other sites that have uh, basically engaged in this process, and I want to say yes to focus on the highest risk populations by AMI. A AMI. Uh, extra points for programs that address uh, priority areas, percentages of available funding designated for priorities, uh, for instance, um, manage different kinds of activities in discrete pools. I thought that was a really good lesson learned from other places. Focusing on community coalitions and community organizing, I think, is another great um, example of effective work from other, other uh, locales that are doing this kind of work. Um, I think we, there's a lot to be learned from those particular uh, experiences. Um, on page 10, you have listed uh, different options about moving forward, and uh, those options are adopt the work group recommendations, create f uh, funding priorities or categories for funding nonprofits, capacity building, startup matching operations, uh, establish a commission to review the data and set funding priorities. I say yes to all those. I think those are really important establish a commission to create a new ABRT process, 
which, uh, and create commissions to a commission to establish a new ABRT process, review the data, review recommendations, create a uh, new process, and set funding priorities. I say that's a great recommendation, too, and I hope that you move forward on that as well. Again, um, just, to, just to reiterate, I think at some point we really need um, some kind of review that really drills down deeply into the perspectives and experiences of affected communities, low income, uh, people of color, um, who are recipients of these kinds of, of services. I think we need to drill down even further than we have so far in order to get their perspectives into the mix in terms of um, revising the ABRT process. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Hi. Um, my name is Maureen Brondike, and I am the director of New City Arts. Um, I am in my ninth year there. Uh, we have applied for ABRT funding, I believe, the last four years, and in our we're in our second year of receiving funding. Um, I believe arts and culture is going to be discussed today, so this hopefully won't be repetitive. But um, I am really grateful that you all are evaluating the ABRT process. Um, I am not here to talk about New City Arts. Um, but am here to talk about uh, funding for arts and culture, um, which again, I'm very thankful that um, the city supports through ABRT. Um, many of the artists that we work alongside through our programs um, benefit from other nonprofits in the community, work for other nonprofits in the community, and participate in a lot of the different arts and culture organizations, some of which receive ABRT funding and others don't. Um, artists like Karina Monroy, who's the director of Creciendo Juntos, uh, JJ Johnson, who drives for Jaunt, Mary Lamb, who's a downtown librarian, um, Lou Haney, who we currently are, have on exhibit, who also works at Second Street and PVCC. Uh, many of these artists um, will be, um, I believe, impacted by um, the changes that are made through ABRT, um, as well as the well-being of many residents in our community. Um, I have been vocal since our first experience with ABRT that I would love to see the process evaluated and improved. Um, a lot of arts and culture organizations sort of feel like um, applying for ABRT is like trying to fit a circular peg into a square hole. Um, not because of the data metrics requirements, those are really wonderful for us and have improved a lot of the ways that we collect feedback from um, a lot of uh, the people that engage with our programming. Um, it's, it sounds like more it's because um, for many arts and culture organizations, they sort of feel like um, an application and review process that was designed for human services was sort of copied and pasted to support arts and culture, which again, the source of support is wonderful, um, but it doesn't feel contextualized to the impact that arts and culture organizations are having and the, the kind of impact that it sounds like you all want to see happen. Um, Richmond, I, I have provided this in some of the CNE feedback, so this may be included, but the city of Richmond, which again, I realize is a very different community, a larger community than ours, they revised their RFP within the last few years so that organizations applying have to align with the goals and objectives of the city. They also have to meet certain criteria, including equity criteria, but then they apply under either health and human services, education, or arts and culture. And under arts and culture, there are sort of three main areas of impact. One is access to culture, so organizations that reduce the barriers to participation, including financial barriers. Cultural equity, so supporting organizations that are supporting artists who work towards social justice and equity, as well as advancing neighborhood vitality, so any kind of creative place-making initiative which can include artists that are uh, partnering with other organizations and community groups to improve transportation or housing, as well as uh, organizations that are physically improving a location or a place. Um, an example of um, how I believe this process should be benefiting organizations, but uh, it feels inaccessible and opaque is the bridge. Um, so the bridge is a peer organization of ours that we partner with often so that we aren't replicating services. And um, they have never applied to ABRT, even though I believe that they align with at least three of the city's goals and objectives. They lead the Charlottesville Mural Project and are doing a lot of really wonderful programs in our community, but have felt like for arts and cultural organizations, the process has been sort of inaccessible and opaque. Um, so I'm not advocating that we necessarily adopt Richmond's process, um, but I am um, thankful that you all are evaluating this and um, would love to see a full review of how ABRT and the city specifically support arts and culture because I think that um, some strategic improvements 
could benefit artists and residents in a really meaningful way, create a more transparent uh, process, um, an application process and review process, um, and um, improve the way that arts and culture organizations partner with the city to more effectively create a thriving and equitable community. Thanks. And before the next person, I just, and I think your story, if I'm remembering correctly, was really interesting, your, just your application process. Wasn't your organization the one, maybe I shouldn't tell the story, you want to tell yeah. it? <laughs> well, I don't have to go into, the first year we applied, um, our application was approved, but then in the uh, city council work session, it, we, weren't, we didn't receive funding based on a decision in a conversation there, and then the second year, we applied at the same application, which wasn't approved, but then council did approve it sort of retroactively. Mm -hmm. It felt just subjective. Um, and so I would love to see the process improve for arts and culture, even if it meant less funding for us. I, um, I feel like they're not just New City Arts, but many organizations could be applying mm -hmm. um, and moving towards the types of work that you all want to do if the process was improved. Yeah. yeah. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Okay, closing public comment. So um, just a little bit of a background around the ABRT sort of improvement process. Um, there's been uh, occasionally someone from the nonprofit community and others will ask like, um, whether this idea of transforming the ABRT process has sort of happened um, all of a sudden, um, but it has been happening uh, in increments uh, for quite some time. Uh, this has been a partnership in terms of joint funding, uh, decision making with the county since 1984, and so there's been at least some conversation around process um, and agreements between the city and the county um, since that time with some pretty significant um, changes in process in 91, 99, 2006, 2011, 2016, and 2017, all of which have been related to identifying metrics to try to create some degree of objectivity in the process. I will say that um, a lot of those um, tools or processes have been some of the sources of concerns that have been expressed by uh, ABRT recipients over the years. Um, so there was some conversation in the meeting in January about the Batten School report um, because it was the sort of most robust and potentially external. There are lots of ways in which this isn't, doesn't quite qualify, um, but it was um, a more robust sort of evaluation, uh, the more recent robust evaluation that we've had. And they had nine recommendations, uh, three of which uh, were uh, the bolded ones or the ones that they felt like were the ones we should adopt um, and change first. Um, there was some conversation in there. Um, we started with the, a concern that we had, uh, the only concern that we brought to Batten when we did this was that the, there had been uh, regular comments about concerns about the lack of transparency and the uh, lack of objectivity in the process. And so this sense that it wasn't, unf that it was, it wasn't a fair process and that it happened, um, at, that there were tools being used that, they, that nonprofits weren't aware of. And so this, uh, that was the only concern that I presented to the folks from Batten, the students, and they took the whole semester to work on this. And so these are the recommendations that they came up with. Um, so um, this objectivity and conflict of interest uh, issue has come up several times. Um, so in the summer of last year, Mayor Walker and Councilmember Hill convened a work group to consider additional changes to the ABRT process. Um, at the end of that time, uh, I will say somewhere in the first third of that, uh, the meeting of this group, this group identified the need for following and responding to the nine recommendations of the Batten School. And so they said a lot of the work that they might have done to go back to the beginning and start to, start to try to assess that a lot of that work had been done in a way that they found reasonable and wanted to respond to the Batten School report. And so I just want you to be aware that that group took into consideration past evaluations and, and recommendations around EBRT. But the work group recommended a mission statement, which is one of the most consistent recommendations we've had over the years, is to identify the purpose of ABRT because that would then drive process. Um, because there has been the sense that the ABRT is trying to accomplish multiple kinds of things, like supporting nonprofits that are struggling or supporting the development of nonprofits that might be doing community organizing work, and we'd like to see more of that in the community or supporting nonprofits who have well-established fundraising goals and um, strong uh, sources of sustainability and um, efficacy in terms of internal structures. And those things don't 
they're in the different rubrics. And so it makes sense that people would begin to feel like it wasn't consistent if, we're, if the council was in a position of trying to say yes to multiple kinds of requests. And so this idea of starting with a mission statement allows us to sort of define the, in, the overall intent. And that would be this group identified all of these things are drafts, um, um, but drafts I think everyone in the committee would stand next to. Um, but to address significant and urgent community needs to improve the lives of marginalized community members by funding holistic strategies with the greatest potential to work. And so you can see that that's pretty packed with some value statements in there. For example, addressing significant and urgent needs. So we, the expectation was the sort of data around those things would drive decision making and priority setting. Um, that the focus would be on marginalized community members and not necessarily the community at large and that the expectations would be the strategies would be holistic and so that we weren't sure how that would get implemented as a work group but there was a fair amount of conversation about making sure that people were addressing not just the need that somebody walked in the door with but their needs that they presented with overall and so how would we build that into some kind of funding structure or programmatic expectation and then with the greatest potential to work. So uh, this group spent a lot of time talking about whether that would be best practices or whether that would be proven practices, but the idea would be that this would, uh, we would have some um, proof or demonstration that this was something that would be effective. Um, so then that funding would be available for multiple purposes, capacity building, startup, matching, and operations, and that operations would be dedicated uh, to those organizations that were meeting the most urgent or significant needs in the community. That funding would be used to invest in underserved areas and to address the priority needs. That funding would be provided in large enough amounts to yield significant results. I am embarrassed to tell you how many hours we spent talking about the phrase move the needle, <laughs> about whether we liked that or didn't like that. But uh, in fact, that's what we meant was being able to actually have a measurable impact on whatever those significant community needs are. Um, and that a commission be established to, to determine the priority needs and areas so that that, to, that prioritization would not be city staff or city council, that it would be driven by a, a, a formal commission whose job it would be to review prescribed sets of data and then identify uh, some set of priority areas. There, later I'll talk about the fact that some communities have very broad uh, priority areas and some have very specific uh, priority areas and specific strategies that they'd like to fund. We did not get to a place in our work group conversations to define that any, any more than saying priority areas and so we take direction from everyone on that. Um, so you all considered those on January 22nd and then asked that a work session be set up to complete um, to identify additional or next steps and you asked for some data. Um, so you asked for data from um, how the nonprofits felt about the four uh, proposed uh, what I've been referring to as buckets but uh, funding areas and then to the extent possible to get information about constituents who receive services from the, uh, the nonprofit community. So that's how we got here. And uh, the Center for Nonprofit Excellence is going to, Christine Nardi is here to share some information that they've gathered from nonprofits. Good afternoon, and thank you, counselors, for inviting CNE to gather nonprofit stakeholder feedback. We really appreciate the opportunity to do that in order to help inform your thinking about the revisions to the ABRT process. I want to thank Kaki especially for her feedback along the way and helping us. Uh, design a nonprofit stakeholder feedback process uh, and really helping uh, to provide clarity to nonprofits around how council arrived at this moment uh, and what the current thinking was for council around the revisions to the process. Uh, at CNE, we focus on strengthening nonprofits. Uh, and so, given that, we really share your commitment to uh, making sure that uh, there's funding for, for uh, citizens of all stripes to thrive, and also making sure that you provide really uh, stored your financial resources as effectively and as efficiently as possible. So with that in mind, uh, what I'd like to do is highlight just a few key statistics from uh, the process that we went through to get nonprofit stakeholder feedback uh, and also some themes that we found from the information. I'm happy to take questions too, either during or after. Um, so first, 
our goal was to try and highlight a, a real diversity of voices. Uh, at CNE, we have about 300 member nonprofits, but we work with nonprofits all across the region. Our nonprofits are small, uh, all volunteer nonprofits to large uh, uh, multi office, multi operational nonprofits. And so, what we really wanted to do is try and reach to both established nonprofits, uh, and we know this is of question and concern to council, making sure that we're also touching newer and grassroots emerging nonprofits who are doing important community work. Um, I have so, one question sure. about the um, participants. How many um, of the 120 participants were organizations that were run by um, minority? That's or? that's not data that we collected because it was an anonymous survey. So it's not we didn't collect demographic demographic data. Okay. So how many came to the um, event that you had after? the data was collected. So we had 38 organizations that came, 12 who'd not previous, previously received ABRT funding, mm -hmm. but again, we didn't count uh, the leadership in terms of who were leaders of color and who weren't, although I can tell you that there were leaders of color in the room. So we've had, um, we have a group, uh, nonprofit leaders of color. Mm -hmm. um, we meet the team. I'm the co-chair, I can't remember what days we meet. Like the first and third Wednesdays of every month. Um, and to that point, uh, I know a couple of them went to this meeting, but there was discussion that uh, a lot of us didn't know um, about it. So I think there are some holes there. And then I, I mean, I think it would also be important if we could use that avenue. Uh, Mary Coleman also serves as the other co-chair from um, City of Promise, or now the interim director if we could also maybe get her to send the survey to the rest of the group. We'd be, we'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of our outreach, we included this in the report, um, but we did outreach through our normal channels, which are to reach out through our weekly e-newsletter. Uh, we also shared the survey link uh, with a couple of uh, community stakeholder partners, like the Community Foundation and Virginia Organizing, in an effort to make sure that we were including not just CNE member organizations, but also organizations, uh, again, that were small or grassroots or may not uh, typically access services uh, from CE and uh, and may, may not otherwise be reviewing our e-newsletter. So we did attempt to, to go more broadly um, than we might ordinarily. And what I will say in terms of the results is that what you can see is that we had 59% or close to 60% who had not previously applied for ABRT funding. Right. Uh, and so, so that's suggestive of the, the fact that what we did include in that survey sample were both organizations that had experience with ABRT funding or were knowledgeable about it, but also organizations that weren't. And you'll see more information about that in the in the summary themes in the data. So in terms of the, the feedback that the, that the survey uh, provided in terms of the current ABRT process, what you can see is that a large majority of those who received ABRT funding really feel like the city staff have been helpful. Uh, and a solid majority feel like the process and the application are easy to understand and complete. There was a slight majority uh, of those surveyed that felt like the on-site evaluation uh, and the awards decisions were transparent, uh, but what that means is uh, there's 45% who felt like it wasn't in terms of those who were surveyed. Yes? So I just want to understand that that subgroup includes all applicants of ABRT, not just those who received <laughs> funding? Yep, whether okay. they received funding or not. Okay. Uh, in terms of understanding the current ABRT funding priorities, uh, although a majority reported that they understand how the city selects funding priorities and how they factor into funding decisions, 40% of those who responded to the survey felt like they lacked clarity and 25% weren't really confident in their ability to speak to the funding priorities in the ABRT application. So remember back to the beginning, we had 120 applicants, but, but, but about 60% hadn't applied for ABRT funding before. So. Uh, the, the data that you see here, I think, is representative uh, to a certain degree of that fact. So there's clearly an opportunity as you're uh, redesigning the process for stronger communication with nonprofits that are seeking to receive city funding to build a funding alignment around city priorities. 
We also uh, asked specifically uh, if your organization hasn't received ABRT funding or if your organization hasn't applied, why is that? And the answers that we received are not surprising, uh, but in rank order, about 29 of the 57 respondents said that they were unaware of the ABRT process. About 19 said that they didn't believe that they had, had the correct data or the documents in order to uh, be competitive for the process. And then about 12 said they didn't think their organization would be awarded or would receive funding. Uh, so for those who have applied and received funding, there was an average of about uh, between 1 and 32 percent uh, of, of that funding being uh, contributing to their total operating budget. So the full range was about 1 to 32 percent for ABRT funding and how it fit into the operating budget. In terms of the potential future ABRT funding priorities, uh, what you can see is that, uh, as Kaki mentioned, the working group really recommended that council consider revising the ABRT process to provide four buckets of funding. So in this, in this survey, we, uh, we asked about those four buckets of funding. And uh, the survey asked for nonprofits feedback on these proposed future priorities. Um, and greater than 25% um, more than the next closest category, nonprofits who responded said that they would uh, really find most valuable programmatic support. Uh, not surprising since programmatic support is the bread and butter of um, being able to accomplish your programs in the community. I, I don't think there was clarity uh, around whether programmatic support would uh, mean kind of general operating support in smaller uh, uh, bundles or would mean this priority funding for programmatic support. So that's something still that I think needs clarity in the, in the conversation and the discussion and certainly in the understanding around um, nonprofits and uh, access to this funding. Uh, another point of discussion raised by the, the city was whether or not you would focus uh, primarily or solely on, on priority funding areas. Kaki mentioned kind of move the needle funding uh, as opposed to maintenance or ongoing general operating support. Um, and if you can see, if you combine the 52% and the 30%, 30 uh, really in terms of the 120 who responded to this, this survey, um, most of them really would uh, find most valuable having the general operating support, which isn't surprising, or having both, making sure that there's general operating support as well as priority funding support for areas that the city finds valuable and important. So we did also collect data around client satisfaction, trying to glean really what nonprofits approach was in determining uh, whether clients were satisfied with services and whether there were changes made as a result of feedback from clients. Um, and so what we discovered here is, of the, again, of those surveyed, 79% regularly satisfaction data and 78% have an intentional process to use the data to inform their programmatic improvements. Uh, slightly less than that, 64% regularly collect data about how, how clients would improve ways in which an organization provides services. So another thing that we wanted to, to explore and find out was if organizations aren't collecting data uh, around client satisfaction, why is that and what are, the, what are the limitations or the restraints around doing that? And you can see uh, that really the, the focus is uh, a, a feeling of a, a lack of investment of staff time, a lack of support, uh, staff support to be able to adequately capture, analyze, and share the data, and a, a limited access to training and expertise around evaluation. And so when you're thinking about uh, funding around capacity building, I think one of the important things to consider is one key area for capacity building for nonprofits, particularly grass, grassroots small and emerging nonprofits, is having the capacity, the human capacity, the technical capacity to be able to uh, engage in evaluation in an ongoing meaningful way. Um, and so, so uh, that's, that's something I think important to consider around data collection, but uh, what we found encouraging was that a, a, a wide majority of nonprofits are in fact uh, collecting data around client satisfaction and really taking that in an ongoing basis, using that to evolve and revise and develop their programs to have more impact. So we identified a couple summary process themes in, in the report. Uh, again, this is specifically related to, to process, 
um, but there, there are three things. One is this question of collaboration. And uh, the folks that took the survey felt like there was real opportunity to, for the city to help foster collaboration in, in, in the process uh, between emerging nonprofits and established nonprofits. Um, and that potentially there was opportunity for, for the city to collaborate with other strategic funders uh, in the community who were looking at either investing in priority areas that were similar to what the city was interested in investing. Um, and for example, uh, there were some suggestions around, and I know this has surfaced before, but having a common application uh, across uh, funding entities. Uh, for example, the city and the county have had a common application and other funding entities having a common application so that nonprofits have the ability to apply for um, funding once in a, in a high priority area and to be more efficient and effective in the use of their time and how they implement those programs. Um, in terms of the, the strengthening the communication piece of this, uh, uh, there was reference to um, some real feedback that's been a thread throughout the ABRT process around um, the need for really full and transparent and a detailed feedback loop between the review team and the, and the city providing funding and the nonprofits who are seeking funding, uh, both to better understand who could qualify for the funding, uh, but also uh, in terms of the feedback around uh, what, how the funding is being implemented and what the evaluation expectations are um, for, for that funding. And so what the data shows us is that the nonprofits who were surveyed really believe that there's an opportunity for more of a feedback loop, more of an effective feedback loop in order to bring more nonprofits into the mix uh, and in order to really effectively evaluate how the work is, is going. Uh, and then lastly, a real focus on the review team and a belief that um, for right now it's the agency budget re review team, if it's a priority setting commission, whatever it is that uh, ends up being the structure, that it be very important that there be uh, uh, people with, uh, who are clients who have lived experience on the review team as well as people who have nonprofit and philanthropy expertise. And I think that was um, demonstrated in at least the draft of the priority setting commission that, uh, that it was going to be reflective of all the stakeholders uh, in the mix and that there be a real opportunity for uh, support from the city or support, say, from an outside consultant in order to make sure that the review team has, uh, is oriented well uh, and that there's an understanding of um, sort of uh, things like uh, ethical engagement uh, uh, on the part of funders, uh, strategic grant making, evaluation, um, things that really matter, particularly if you're looking at funding uh, at, at a priority level and a high level over a period of time, and that there be investments made in the review team so that it can uh, both reflect the priorities of the city and of the council, uh, but also uh, be really strategic and productive in, in how it builds the relationships with nonprofits and how it achieves the goals that it seeks to achieve. So um, the report, uh, the survey report indicates that there's real opportunity there for um, considering how to strengthen that review review team process. Uh, in terms of the funding categories I referenced before, there was a, a high priority placed around having a both and funding approach. Not surprising. Uh, what we asked was what nonprofits would find most valuable. And so um, general operating support is always valuable for nonprofits who are seeking to, uh, to provide services that either the city can't or uh, isn't in a position to provide uh, and that, that Charlottesville citizens find valuable. Uh, but there was also a real understanding and a belief that a priority funding area approach could be very uh very uh, worthwhile. Um, and the question is, if you're going to um, provide uh, a, a priority funding, making sure that you don't create a vacuum in core services, uh, in core services that are be, being funded now, and that if you're funding organizations that you consistently fund them, uh, particularly the ones that are demonstrating impact over time and providing the services that the city finds valuable and is unable to provide, uh, or that nonprofits can provide more efficiently and effectively. Uh, as Maureen spoke, uh, the, there were definitely there was definitely feedback in the survey around separating out arts and culture in some way, making sure that it has its own funding process with different evaluation criteria. Uh, there was a, a request uh, among a variety of, of folks who took the survey around clarifying what startup means, and in particular looking at uh, if you're funding startup 
uh, is it startup organizations or is it startup programs? And would there be an opportunity to receive funding if, for example, a small grassroots nonprofit saw the opportunity to uh, to partner with a, a, a more established nonprofit to start a new program? Would there be opportunity for funding under the startup bucket? Um, and then, and then in the fourth category around the matching funds. Uh, the feedback was to, to make those matching funds more flexible and rather, rather than base them arbitrarily on a specific dollar amount, base them instead on a percentage of the project or a percentage of the, the operating budget. Uh, and then just one more slide around highlights uh, for the funding approaches generally. So uh, in terms of building capacity, if there's a shift to priority grants, the recommendations coming out of the survey were uh, that council consider how to make multi-year investments. Um, that if you're looking to fund priority issue areas and to move the needle or to dig deeper on solving community challenges, that that's more than a one and done uh, funding cycle. And so uh, focusing particularly on multi-year investments in increasing the capacity of, um, of uh, all the stakeholders in the mix to really clearly define what the impact metrics are in, in partnership with clients and nonprofits, and then to build this kind of ongoing uh, communication loop with nonprofits if you are funding those nonprofits over time to achieve particular goals so that, uh, so that there's an opportunity for give and take in terms of how the funding is being used. Uh, and an evolution in how that funding is being applied to have the deepest impact. In terms of uh, collaboration, recommendations um, circulated around uh, really considering seriously the impact of moving away from collaborating with the county, the city-county collaboration that's happened over a number of years, uh, the impact uh, of that both on the nonprofit sector but also on uh, key stakeholders like clients and customers. Um, and then uh, thinking about how to uh, really engage with other strategic funding partners um, to, to make sure that, that your funding uh, priorities are aligned uh, and potentially that you're communicating more readily, for example, with the Community Foundation or the United Way or the health system or uh, uh, key anchor institutions in town that are providing ongoing priority funding uh, and figuring out a way to do that within uh, either the review team or the priority setting commission, whatever it looks like, so that your priority funding isn't uh, offering, say, just as an example, $100,000 worth of funding over a three-year period and not really engaging over time to make sure that uh, you're achieving the goals that you want to achieve and there's ongoing communication about that with, with uh, the nonprofits in the mix. And then lastly, as has been um, said, around equity and transparency, making sure uh, there was some sense, there was a thread throughout the feedback that nonprofits, some nonprofits felt like um, they, they really didn't have access to ABRT um, and, and making sure that there's um, equity around uh, uh, who, who gets to apply for ABRT um, and that it's based not just on how long you've been in the system but whether or not you have a program that seems like a program that the city wants to bet, uh, bet for and uh, making sure that the, there's transparency around uh, the ability to access these funds and the goal of these funds. So that returns back uh, to the beginning and Kaki's comment around setting a real mission statement about what your goals are for this funding and then being able to devise a program and stick to that mission statement so there's clear clarity and transparency for nonprofits about whether to not whether or not even to apply for the funding. Um, so I think that's that's it and I'm happy to take any questions or turn it over to Kaki to talk about community feedback. So I have a question mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure if this is the right moment but I'll just ask anyway, does the city, do we, do we have a tracker of how many nonprofits of color we currently fund? How would you define nonprofits? So led, led by, um, led by someone of color yeah. or whose primary customers are people of color? So either or. No. We don't have, a, oh yeah. No. I, 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 I'm interested in. That was my I, I question. Think Around when we talk about the community feedback, I'm interested in, in both because I, f I feel like we have a, a, a number of uh, community members who don't feel like they have access to the traditional set of yeah. uh, nonprofits, and maybe they're connected, as I think you would suggest. But um, but, but there isn't. I, we haven't kept like a separate list. In fact, tonight's the first time I've heard that there was a the nonprofit leaders mm -hmm. of color. Mm -hmm. And then I would also be interested, uh, or not interested. I'm concerned to a certain extent about. Um, if I'm being candid, just organizations, the second part, 
Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. You, can I get a can I get a pound? <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, shout out to Mr. Wheeler. I, in all seriousness, though, I, I am interested or rather concerned with organizations oftentimes that state that they're focusing um, on communities of color, but it's only to get the grant money, and then after that, communities don't see them anymore. Or it's a genuine interest, but their capacity to actually make the connection is uh, taxed um, mm -hmm. by all kinds of things. And so I, I don't always think that it's about pursuing the money, but about a genuine interest in serving that community, but then not being able to actually implement it in a way that actually engages people. We've been talking a lot about stickiness mm -hmm. um, of those kinds of services uh, where uh, folks, uh, particularly in low wealth communities and in low wealth communities of color where people feel like, particularly young people feel like they uh, are, re are reflected and represented and they're getting their needs met so that it's sticky, so that they, they not only attend a couple of times, but they stay with it over the years. And so what we hear is there's a lot of sampling of potential um, uh, sort of service providers, but there's nothing, there's, there's few places where particularly young people of color feel like they want to stay oh, for yeah. a long period of time. And so that's one of the things we hear pretty consistently yeah. from young mm -hmm. people. And yeah. that's why I was asking the question about who was in the room, because look at who's in the room today. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Mr. Murphy, the equity discussions, um, I would like to see if we can fit um, how, you know, to evaluate equity within nonprofits too, if that's possible. Um, I know it may be off, but if, you know, from, you know, what you started with, but if there's a way to look at that um, in terms of the evaluation process that we come up with, I would like maybe for if the group that you have, if you all can have that conversation about what that would look like. And, and if, I, if I could just say, in terms of the, the concept of nonprofits applying for funding to serve communities of color and then not, uh, not following through on that, uh, that commitment or that goal, I think one of the other key factors here is uh, what kind of funding the nonprofits is receiving to do, uh, in order to do that, and a real kind of frank conversation between the funder and nonprofit around what the funding provided allows. Uh, and so making sure that if, if the funding provided uh, allows for a piece of that but not the whole of that, there's a real clear understanding and managing expectations of that at the start. Uh, rather than uh, disappointment on either par party's part at the, at the end of that. And I think with your comment just now, we have to flip the way we look at this mm -hmm. because it shouldn't be a disappointment on the part of either the funder or the nonprofit. If the nonprofit can't meet the needs of the community, then they shouldn't apply for the funding in the first place. And then we have a duty to make sure that if the, whatever the, um, holistic needs are, or even the mission statement, if it's not aligned and if the funding that we, if you don't have multiple funding streams to meet the needs, um, then do you accept this funding stream too? I think that that's absolutely a, a fair point. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the way to evaluate that again is um, what we talked about looking at uh, how the nonprofit uh, and how the clients are in communication about whether the needs are being met and whether the nonprofit is working in partnership with the client to meet those needs. And the, the way that you determine that is uh, making sure that the nonprofit has the resources that it needs in order to, to be really truly engaging with its clients. Um, and that's a, that's a responsibility of all of us in thinking about how we fund our programs and our priorities. But I do think that we have to start looking at that a little bit differently mm -hmm. because um, there's a way to be effective and if you are not meeting um, the needs of the clients you're serving, then you can't serve them. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you're not the best person. I don't know if you all had that conversation during this meeting um, about whether people are really able to serve the clients that, um, come into their organization. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, I don't think it's on. <coughs> we need to hear your booming voice. <laughs> <laughs> Press the button. There you are. Uh, so I think that maybe the, the key starting point uh, when 
uh, you're talking about government <coughs> funding for nonprofits, and you know, I mean that's the process that we're revamping mm -hmm. here. Um, and I think part of what makes us special to me is that Charlottesville is a local government that decides to invest in nonprofits, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's important. It's one of the reasons uh, that you know I wanted to and stayed working here. I think that is a good feature mm -hmm. of uh, this area. Um, but I think uh, it kind of moves out in concentric rings. And what the first thing that we want to consider is how are the nonprofits extending the impact of the goals of the local government, right? And so uh, with, because one of the things you want to do is maybe not continue to grow local government employees to do some of these services. And you would hope uh, and I think it is the case that many times your investment helps nonprofits to leverage other funds, uh, and so these are employees you're not adding to local government. So um, I think that I definitely uh, am hearing and agree with many of the mayor's points, but our starting point should be let's figure out where are the places we're trying to make impact that extend logically from our services out how many rings do we want to go out on that? Um, and once you're driven by where you're trying to make the impacts, then uh, you can evaluate how each nonprofit is making the impacts that you're looking to make, right? Um, and uh, I think that uh, uh, one of the lenses will certainly be how they interact uh, with the clients, uh, what are the outcomes they're achieving, um, what uh, do they, um, you know, how do they um, use the equity principles that we're talking about uh, putting into the city. I think there's a lot of different layers to what that evaluation looks like mm -hmm. that will probably merge some of the work that we're talking about in one group with what you're talking about here. But um, I think it has to start first with some direction from the governing body about what you're trying to do, right, uh, before we can decide which nonprofits we're applying this to. Sorry. So we looked at a number of uh, different ways to get some feedback. I think the, the group initially talked about ways that we could use our Facebook connections and we really struggled with it, like what questions to ask and how to ask them. And so acknowledging that we do not have great data about from people who receive uh, nonprofit services as part of our feedback tonight. We have some generalized data to offer. Um, but it is a priority and a gap for us to get better feedback from if we're interested in, there was a fair amount of conversation in the work group about getting direct feedback from the consumers of the services that the ABRT process was funding. And so there is, has always been embedded in the ABRT <coughs> process a request for information about how do you receive feedback from your customers and your clients, and then how do you use that? Give us an example about how you use that to transform or change your practice. Um, and so this, it's always been embedded, um, but there, there was a sense from the work group that that was insufficient, and so that there was a strong interest in getting more direct feedback. And actually, the work group spent a fair amount of time talking about like what kinds of evaluative questions that could be embedded in a future ABRT grant that you would be asked to ask the following questions and then report that back as part of a, a report out back to the local government. So uh, I just acknowledge that we don't, uh, that, that doesn't exist at the moment. And so we have cobbled together some additional things. So we did a survey on the uh, city website. Many thanks to Mr. Wheeler for putting that together. Received 478 responses. That we asked two questions. We asked, um, "What do you think? What services would you like to see more of in the community?" And so, uh, no shock, <laughs> uh, housing, uh, mental health, and uh, I was a little surprised by energy efficiency. It was pleased, but I was surprised to see that in the top three. Uh, we came back, um, and I'll just point out that the um, I think Leslie Beauregard's going to going to or has already shared the results of the National Citizen Survey that was done last fall, and our reports have come out that. In that survey, um, the community uh, respondents are asked uh, what um, particularly what priorities they have, and that's a 
fairly long list uh, to make it through this um, to identify the priorities and the top five priorities for the National Citizen Survey are preparing students for academic and vocational success, increasing affordable housing, uh, being responsible stewards of, national, of natural resources, um, intentionally addressing issues of race and equity, and this is the first time we've had that piece that's actually been built into our National Citizen Survey, so I was pleased to see it rise to the top immediately, um, and preparing residents for the workforce. And so just in terms of sort of the, the ex acknowledging the faultiness of both of these as sources of information from the community, uh, but the priorities that are identified by the general public. Um, of the folks who answered saying that they had been recipients of services at nonprofits, um, acknowledging the broad definition of services provided by nonprofits in our town, we're, we're fortunate to have a lot of nonprofits in our community providing a wide variety of kinds of services, not always safety net services. Um, and, uh, but the vast, vast majority, there were two negative comments of all of the comments for the survey. One of them said no, the, service, the services they received were incomplete, and the other said yes and no. Um, that was the extent of the comments. And so the vast majority were very positive comments about people receiving services, and mostly around um, the uh, improvements in quality of life um, for them as recipients of nonprofit services. I will say that we regularly, both in focus groups that are sort of more generalized or more specific, we recently did a bunch of focus groups around equity in the local schools. We did some around criminal justice issues in the last couple of months. And we regularly hear um, through our uh, sort of community partners uh, frustrations and concerns, particularly around communities of color in terms of accessing uh, services. And so I've been a part of a number of conversations in this community where access is interpreted as knowledge of. And it is clear to me by asking additional questions that it's not about knowledge of. People understand what's available to them. It doesn't feel like it is for them. And so it, that's about having the walking in the front door and feeling like this is a safe and welcoming place for me and everything I bring with me. And that that is really consistent, a consistent message we hear related to consumers of mental health services broadly in the community, particularly um, members of the communities of color, and particularly around young people of color. Um, that they don't, that they, have they have tried. So have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you gone here? Have you gone there? And the answer is almost always yes, but it didn't feel right to me. It didn't feel like a place where I could be uh, vulnerable and a place where I could make those connections. And so people don't look like a, they don't look like the consumers. I think that's absolutely right. And I think that's part of what the definition of safe and welcoming is for people that they don't feel like they're reflected or they feel like they're the, they're one of or two of in a room full of people who are providing services. And so that I just that is a consistent message that yeah. we receive in all of the ways. Um, and then also we hear the message around flexibility, like the flexibility to provide services that are um, not about making a commitment that you're in the same place at the same hours, three days, three times a week on the same weeks, that, that a, a service that's more flexible where you can sort of check in and out and have multiple kinds of commitments and expectations, but also a life that may be more disorganized than the nonprofit is hoping uh, your life might be set up with. And we hear that there's a, there's a disconnect around the way services get delivered, not necessarily around safe and welcoming, but that the way the service gets delivered doesn't match the young person. This is a feedback around for young people, the young people's lives, the way that they live their lives and how much time they have available and those kinds of things. And so I think it's important that we, um, because again, those two pieces of feedback are really consistent in my experience. Um, so, um, we did a ton of learning staff before the work group started, ongoingly during the work group about, uh, from other communities, and it is a very, very um, common thing for communities to say, for local governments to say, we would like to use our government money to support funding priority areas. There's a hundred ways in which priority areas is defined, identified, um, and uh, narrowed or broadened. So uh, both Richmond and Portland, Maine have impact priority areas where they're fairly broad, like housing or seniors, and so not very drilled down or specific. Um, and some other places have really standardized pro program processes where they say the service doesn't matter as much as the way you deliver it, and so they have expectations about, um, for example, they might include words like, uh, a res like a strong respect for confidentiality or the dignity for all or safe and welcoming space or those kinds of things. They're, frankly, those things are value statements and not particularly well defined in the local governments where I can see those, um, but they are aspirational with some expectation about the way that you, you are inclusive in your approach and not exclusive. 
Um, there are some uh, programs that are some gov local governments who said we're only going to support safety net programs. That they're, and that they had defined that in a, a couple of different ways, that their priority is to say um, these were services that otherwise the city would be obligated to provide if they weren't being provided by number. Yeah, sorry. Just a question. Is, was the, did you come across any, like looking at the, at the last couple of reports, there's such a distinction between the organizations that are getting like over $100,000 or a couple hundred, and it's really a major, like Region 10 or OAR, they're just different organizations were were for lots of different reasons the amount of the nature of the contribution is structurally a big part of what they're doing and sometimes that goes and there's a difference between that and like these smaller amounts thirty or forty thousand dollars and I'm just curious is there have other cities distinguished between major structural kind of contributions that are ongoing as opposed to I, I don't know how you would do that, but I'm curious if there's a distinction between the scale and the... Yes, and actually in the next slide, it oh, talks okay. about that. And that's okay. all right. Just about having a different it's so kind small, of... so small, That was a really big version right here. Um, the uh, really um, a very different application right. processes based on the amounts. And so there are some, I think that you think about the way the Community Foundation has, re, has re, uh, revised the way that they provide funding over the last several years into in several different buckets and uh, one of which is a ten thousand uh, dollar pool and uh, and the other which is you know a multi-year uh, around systems improvement and then the other would potentially be like a population change grant that would be bigger and longer and involve more uh, sort of a, clearly a much more sort of engaged f uh, application process and so okay. there are communities who say if you're getting ten thousand dollars fill out these two pieces of paper for us. Yeah. And then they're saying, if you're going to give us, if, if you want 50000 mm -hmm. then you have to fill out more and it has to match a priority area. Or we're going to only invite people to apply for this thing that we really care about moving the needle on this year and we have 300000 for, those kinds of things. So there are lots of organizations, lots of local governments who have changed the way they do that application process to reflect the amount of the gift. I will say that the way we've acquired that list of people who get a lot of money versus people, uh, organizations who don't get a lot, is really just based on history. It's not, it's not that the ABRT pool gets reviewed every year and we say this is how much we have to spend and our needs are here and this application should get X percentage of our dollars to support that. We really are, have been funding pretty consistently on what you got last year. And so it's an artificial reflection. It's not a reflection of either community need or um, sort of city endorsement um, of the proposal. It really is based on how you entered the system. So that's one of the regular pieces of feedback we get is that it's hard to go up or it's hard to change the amount of funding you get and that it's largely based on history, not necessarily on quality of delivery of services or the community need. Um, so there are also uh, organizations or local governments that say they're going to they're only going to fund services uh, for folks of um, based on AMI, and so some of that is very low and some of that's a range, um, but that they qualify that their gifts or um, contracting with local uh, nonprofits just based on the uh, AMI. Um, and then that there are others that have their priorities that are not necessarily specified, but they're embedded in the review, and so they're, they're, you get additional points. So everybody's welcome to apply, but that you, those organizations that are addressing priority areas get extra points, and so they're more likely to get either a higher percentage of their ask or um, more likely to sort of rise to the top because of that. And then there are still others that say that they have, uh, they're clarified to their nonprofit constituents, this is how much we're going to give away to safety net programs or self-sufficiency programs or community livability programs. And so as opposed to looking at how we funded your organization you, last year, the year before, the year before, we say this is, we feel comfortable with our, our, whatever our pool of money is being distributed the following ways. And then we match nonprofit services to the pools that we've already pre-identified. All of that is to say there are lots of local governments who have chosen to move towards a priority setting process and that looks really different from community to community. I will say that the Richmond application that Maureen identified is really a, a rich source of good information about both about process and outcome for us uh, moving forward and it reflects a lot of what we've already talked about in all of the, the proposals that have come up. Um, I have a, a comment yep. and a question on because what's what's just occurring to me now is that the council's discretionary fund was actually kind of envisioned and then started being used as that vehicle to support 
what I guess you'd call a startup. And to, and to, because what we were hearing three, four years ago was that it was very hard for the new nonprofit, uh, especially um, in one particular case, and I think, Wes, you might remember, it was, uh, you know, women of color heading nonprofits could never break into the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the council discretionary fund wound up being that, which was allowed to be at, serve as a pilot for give money to groups that didn't have uh, a track record. So could that, the history of the use of the city's council discretionary fund be rolled into this? Because it almost feels like it's been an adjunct to kind of, in a way, compensate for some of the, the gaps that the ABRT was, is now identifying. I was going to say one of the things that local governments who have moved towards a more sort of priority-based funding stream have done so over the period of years, and usually two to five years where they've sort of slowly rolled out a change in, in practice around funding, and many of them have created uh, additional pools. And so instead of changing the way that they sort of the current maintenance funding is the way Christina put it of nonprofits, they add a priority pool or they add a capacity building pool, those kinds of things. And so it becomes a yes and uh, sort of mechanism. You don't abandon uh, what's been happening, but you shift your focus around prioritizing for those nonprofits or services where you the community has the highest need. Um, and some of some uh, local governments have done that, have created those additional pools to be able to meet this need for prior, prioritized funding streams, and then over five years uh, switch the percentage of money that's in both pools, right? And so they've slowly sort of taken money out of the maintenance pool and then had all of the maintenance organizations may get like $10,000 a year and su really support two or three in a major way, um, this sort of quote, move the needle kind of money. I will say, and this is something for council to struggle with, um, just based on the way we're set up, is that most of those places really have uh, had the best success with multi-year commitments. And so that, I know that's tricky for us for a number of ways, but the, some of the best practices, uh, sorry, yeah. How do you do that with budgetary rules? Because if you're working on a annual budget, how would you, sorry, how would you obligate a future, you, I mean, do they have different budgeting rules and other? I don't know, but I think in, I don't, cities? they may have different budgeting rules, but I think they, uh, they uh, uh, allocate the money all in one year and then oh, distribute it over they several oh, more that's years. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, huh. Is that what we, what did we do when we did the, um, when we doubled the affordable housing spend? Because we did it over a four year period, right? Did, did we do that? Did we chunk, was there this one chunk and then it was spread out over those years? Because I remember, no, but. Uh, because we did, we made a decision as a council that we were gonna go to 1.6 to 3.2 per year for four or five years and then, it, it was, but we made that decision that one It was at base, it went to one and a half times that, then it doubled. Yeah. Uh, but uh, remember that that lives in the capital improvement capital. program, and so that stuff automatically carries over. It's different than our operational side. Okay. I just was okay. So I, I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of communities have an easier, faster, simpler process for smaller grant amounts, and they define that differently based on where they are. The state of Minnesota has a $10,000 cap, and so you really do have to fill out like a form. It's not even like an application to get that $10,000. Um, and then the 50,000 uh, has is for Richmond. So that's their sort of cutoff point for anything less than 50,000 is a fairly straightforward, easy access process. And anything over 50,000 has a higher uh, sort of demand for the nonprofits. And one of the things we heard for even nonprofits who have been around for a long time and have this sort of built-in capacity for grant writing and at the applications is that this is has always, no matter what kinds of improvements we've made, has always been fairly onerous in terms of time, particularly in comparison to the other kinds of funding sources that they've received and so uh, it, if it's really onerous for those nonprofits who have that sort of built-in internal capacity you can imagine how mysterious it is to somebody who doesn't have that built-in capacity and wants to access these funds um, so improving uh, having a simpler process particularly uh, tied to the amount of money seems like that would be a worthy effort uh, no matter what the structure ends up being um, there are some nonprofits that, uh, I mean, some um, local governments that have said this is the minimum amount we'll give you and the maximum amount we'll give you. And so it limits the range of possibilities, particularly if we're moving away from this idea of historic funding dictating future funding. Um, and then there are just 
so many nonprofits that manage uh, their funding interests in these discrete pools. And so whether they're based on priorities or based on just sort of categories of nonprofits, but like, for example, um, arts and culture have a, a dis designated pool of money with broad priorities and specific outcomes. And so th it's not that they're not evaluated uh, sort of the same with the same kind of rigor that everything else is. It's just that they um, have a different set of requirements uh, that they're being evaluated against. Um, the same with community coalitions and the same with community organizing because you can't really define one set, one rubric that matches the demands of these kinds of pools. And so the idea of it's harder for staff or whoever the review team is, but to identify that we evaluate arts and culture programs like this or we evaluate um, community collaborations like this or those kinds of process organizations, those organizations that are serving as like backbone support for the deliver, the people who deliver the service, they don't quite match with our system either. And so, but we have, the city has an interest in supporting those backbone organizations because they truly do leverage both services and funding. Um, so I think there's some benefit to looking at sort of a discrete sort of types of, um, of service delivery and separating the expectations out. Multi-year funding for collaborations is one way in which they get to this, but there are other organizations, other local governments that do multi-year funding for high priority grants as well. Um, and then this is one of the tricky parts that makes um, the budget folks go a little bit nuts is that the pool size of the pool is determined by the need, not by the fact that you have this prescribed pool, right? So. How you manage that is anybody's guess, but there are some local governments that start with that and say, um, we, we're roughly going to spend around this, but if we got a proposal for something that really matched the, our, you know, a need that we had, we would go up from there. And so, at yeah. do they start, sorry, do they, does that process that you just described, does that come out like in the proposed first? draft of the budget or whatever the system is from the city manager yeah. in those it systems or how does it yeah. does right. it go so back to the, the like the very first strategic you know fr a framing that yes happens so by whoever does it yes so and a lot of those places it's managed so that that is embedded in the very first draft of the city manager's budget that comes out so which is the process has already been completed okay so in this um, year's budget we the, their need this these, is the expectation these, so for nonprofits is this right as uh -huh. opposed to having it drive the other way I think it's tricky, really tricky, um, the sort of mechanism. And, you know, I, I am a huge supporter of nonprofits. I believe they, they provide an incredible quality of life and critical services in our community. And I come from nonprofit land. And still, I would say there probably is a limit to what the city would continue. Like, at some point, the city wouldn't just always expand its pool based on the, the, the um, applications it received, right? So at some point, there had to be some acknowledgement that we will roughly spend this percentage of our overall general fund on external services by nonprofits or something like that. I'm not, I really haven't done a whole lot of research on that component, so I'm not, I don't. Yeah, I was just trying to get a sense for that percentage between, like, what's called the baseline request versus what it could be. I mean, how big of a swing are some of these municipalities considering? Well, I mean, so some of them have said, done this percentage thing, and they've said, we've got $4 million to spend on, non on services for nonprofits, and we're going to fund 50% of it based on the priority needs we've identified, 30% or on safety net programs, 30% mm -hmm. on the priority needs, and then 20% on safety, on uh, quality of life programs. Or 20% uh, of our budget um, is going to go for arts and culture, and we've, we've, in our budget, put a placeholder of one to three million, right? And so they could go up to three if they had three million dollars worth of worthy proposals, or they could, mm. you know, I think it's, it's hard, no matter what. That's a big delta. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Which is why those, community, those communities have really shifted the work around that process really upstream before in the pre-budget <coughs> process. It's not... It's not done simultaneously with the budget process. Uh, I guess another comment then, it would mean that the local government then has to do a lot of homework to understand mm -hmm. what service delivery gaps it has mm -hmm. and how it needs to find them and whether it's the cost benefit of hiring new staff to be permanently on board or to then, in a way, it's like getting a consultant to One do of the an engineering project or a road project. Yeah. 
I think you're absolutely right. So when we talked about strategic grant making or strategic mm. funding at the beginning, there was a fair amount of pushback around strategic versus priority areas. That priority areas, we could say, here's a need that we have. Opioid overdoses are going up, and we would like to, and we'd like to, to spend some more money on services <coughs> to respond to that in a way that, that will work, um, as opposed to saying we have a strategic interest in this particular piece and we want to fund it over multiple years. I think there is a reasonable question about whether this the internal staff uh, have capacity to really manage that kind of strategic grant making in a way that somebody externally would versus saying we've got a priority area and we're roughly going to evaluate based on some of the criteria we've identified to support that. I think there's a nuanced distinction there. Yeah. So um, ultimately, sorry. About that, because I mean, it's still we do need to have the discussion. Um, uh, because if money is being um, allocated to these needs, um, we there is going to have to be some internal work, yes, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. for us to make sure that the impact is happening. So I think about like the difference between what's happening with the community foundation where they initially when they um, I, and I may be this has been a, a year or two since I've sort of keyed into some of their language around this but when they first <coughs> an, an initiated the new uh, system improvement grant then and the potential of the population level grant they talked about the sort of co-creation of those solutions so that you were really the, the nonprofit or the, the system of care that was seeking these grants were really trusting and relying on the community foundation staff as co-creators as those formal consultants or that they would go find those consultants outside as part of their their creation of the system improvement grant and that's just a level of involvement in implementation that we have not had historically mm -hmm. we do a lot of technical assistance um, up front with the grant process but our capacity to sort of evaluate the implementation and impact has been or even process delivery stuff has been really limited um, so I think if we're going to do this differently we would have to either staff it differently or um, improve our capacity some other way whether that's as Ms. Galvin suggested a consultant or something like that to help us manage that and it depends on how many we have right so if we had decided all of a sudden you guys decided to have six million dollars in grants and priority areas I'm just saying um, <laughs> Um, then we would want to staff up to do that appropriately or otherwise we wouldn't be yeah, good okay. stewards of the tax dollar in that process and so we, we need to make sure that we're we're uh, using the right language when we talk about it and so priority areas is one of the, the ways in which the other local governments have gotten there without thinking about that in deep kind of ways so this is this help this slide was really helpful for me because as we're thinking about the changes it's uh, I know we're I'm describing the water we're swimming in or drowning in whatever um, but it does seem to me like these are the three primary sort of questions for you all as you think about how you want to change this process is the ABRT uh, a mechanism for holding nonprofits accountable for service delivery versus a partnering with nonprofits to deliver services I'm not saying it's either or this is none of these are binaries these are about tensions about how you drive decision-making policies or processes in here we have to do probably all of the things up here but um, but one is going to dictate a different process or a way we do that than the other I want to just one piece of feedback just and, and there's gonna be so many different thoughts about this but and like very big picture just like it's possible that we could come to great strategic answers on all these things in a one and done amazing vision that would be like the comprehensive plan or something and it guides us in a totally new direction. But just even having this discussion strategically every year would be a very, would be totally different. I mean, if, the, if this question asking process with whoever the counselors are is mm -hmm. institutionalized from the city manager on down and then the nonprofits know that, that would be really different right now because right now it really is just a leg it's like managing a legacy mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. and then the evaluation process is really weird and it puts the nonprofits in a weird position it puts the decision makers in an odd position mm -hmm. and it's different from saying hey we're now at year 2020 or whatever and this is really a big issue for this city so now we need to tilt in this direction and we have a discussion with counselors and the community about Here's something the city's not well positioned to do that these nonprofits would be well positioned to do, or this is a new, 
you know, like you, we've, you've talked about, affordable housing wasn't as big an issue 10 or 12 years ago before the back to the city move created this crush in affordable housing in the city. So now it's a big issue, so 10 years. So I, I just, I think creating this set of questions for the decision makers mm -hmm. to ask would be a really huge step. And just to, just to framing the sort of the philosophy that drives uh, grant making. And I think sure. we, um, you know, the staff can say we've looked at all the data and the data tell us these are the priority areas. But I think one of the, the things that we're really trying to pay attention to, particularly around equity, is not having that be driven by staff but driven by the community. And fi so finding ways that we can get to authentic engagement with the community to tell us what those things are in time for us to accurately respond and craft a, a process like this is the trick of the day, right? And I think it's worthy of the struggle and worthy of the anxiety and the frustration in the process, but I think that's where we're... Um, so then the second sort of tension is protecting taxpayer dollars by limiting risk, which means investing in those nonprofits that have like the best infrastructure, right? Well, you know, they've got six to, to 12 months worth of operating uh, reserves and they've got, you know, development directors and they've got all kinds of folks inside that you can say, this is, this is a good investment because they're not going to fold anytime soon, right? Um, so, and that's, that is one mechanism and a historic mechanism for us to evaluate whether we want to invest in a nonprofit or do we want to uh, invest in struggling nonprofits that are providing services that we think are really needed in our community. And you guys have struggled with this at the end of the ABRT process that last, the last <coughs> budget day, um, you all have struggled with saying, here's the recommendations which are largely based on investing in nonprofits that have great capacity. But then you have an ask where you think, gosh, we'd really like to support you. We'd like to pay for your audit. If you can't afford an audit and that's your clincher, we'd like to pay for that. But that's a really different philosophy driving that funding. And the implication is that it's unfair to those nonprofits who've worked so hard to get to this place of high capacity. And so that's just the impact, right? That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but maybe what we do is dr we just create a pool where you can say yes to that that's different, right? So that you're not competing with the regular pool for that. I, I thoroughly, sorry, oh, thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed that recommendation um, because I think for many nonprofits, especially ones in which we were describing earlier who are on the ground, who are doing a great deal of the work, they don't have the, the major budgets or even the capacity to be able to write to some of these applications and essentially we penalize them for it. I think of uh, AATF being one and, and you know not to just call them out, but they're doing phenomenal work but their ED, uh, Dr. Wilkerson, you know, and there has been assistance provided and whatnot in terms of uh, applying to this, but she just doesn't have the capacity to be able to write to this kind of application. And that is something that in our nonprofits, yeah, not for that, yeah, for that amount. And when we have our nonprofit leaders of color meeting, that's probably top two issues that we discuss every meeting is just the capacity. We can't, many of our, our smaller nonprofits, like we can't compete with the, the United Ways of the world because we're much smaller, but we're not saying United Way isn't doing work, but I mean like many of us are doing the actual work in this particular segment of the community and we have the results, but because we can't quantify it on paper or articulate it the way others can, you're penalized. Which is, again, sort of a really strong recommendation that the, the work group had, which was to create capacity building opportunities to say, mm -hmm. we'll help you pay for your evaluation. We'll help you figure out what a sustainability development yeah. plan should look like, those kinds of things. And to really diversify the kind of uh, technical assistance that we provide so that we could just say to that person, we'll help you write this. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be a city staff. We'd have to contract with somebody with sort of more arm's length um, sort of distance to, to do that, but that we would help them to do that rather than have them self-select out. Because yeah. that is one of the, que the ways that we've gotten to a place where equity is in question yeah. right around this so and Absolutely. then the third sort of major tension is do we does the uh, the council want to support a wide variety of services that add quality of life to the community right sometimes their safety net and sometimes their quality of life improvement grants um, or do you want to use government money to solve a very specific or urgent problem mm -hmm. and again I, I don't think any one of these are binaries it's just really about sort of what the answer to the question drives the process mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the, the answer to the question drives the budget around it too. And so 
I'm not here with an answer <laughs> for these things, but to describe that these are the tensions. And I think, from my perspective, if we go one too far in one direction and any one of these three tensions, we've made a mistake, that we should be feeling the tension in each one of these to successfully administer. Um, I'm feeling it right now. Are you feeling yes. it? Yes. Good. <laughs> my work here is done. <laughs> Um, so these are among the options to move forward. They are, as uh, Mr. Heineke has suggested, they are not necessarily either wars. Uh, they can be all of the above in some capacity. Um, but we could, uh, you all could, um, uh, I don't, I, to Mr. Signer's comments, I don't think that this is, a, this is going to be something you all vote on or think about tonight, but it, the staff is looking for some direction if we're going to create a resolution, what that resolution should mm -hmm, contain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, create four funding categories for nonprofits, capacity building, startup matching. We heard a little less uh, enthusiasm around a matching grant uh, fund than I think we anticipated in the work group uh, from nonprofits. Of, I was listening to conversations. It seemed like the amount was not like what we yeah, identified maybe as the amount wasn't necessarily applicable to what right. they less have. Than 5, we need more flexibility because yeah. sometimes it's a percentage. Right. And so I just think there was just more of a deeper dive needed. And I think okay. I would speak to that with. Even, I mean, it was less pushback on the categories, but just some of the details that we had, as a work group had yeah. kind of come up with, just without yeah. the knowledge of many of the nonprofits. Yeah, fair enough. We made it. some of that up. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I was there too. We talked about it a lot, but we made yeah. it up. Yeah. So, um, operations <laughs> for priority areas, um, and whether that's an either or um, situation, and then establishing a commission to review the data and set those funding priorities. And so, this was the work group's sort of presentation to you all in January was to set, uh, establish a commission whose job it would be to say, we're going to look at these pieces of data. We have incredible lists of all of the available data that, that we have in the community to run, to do community focus groups, to do community meetings, to hear from people to say, where should this priority money be? If the city wants to set aside 30% of its overall sort of traditional ABRT budget to fund those things that are, are high priority areas, um, what should they be? Um, and have this commission not connected to, to this sort of city, either political body or staff body, to make that sort of determination and, and then give those results and recommendations to the city to then set up the next funding uh, sort of cycle package. Or as it came up um, uh, in January, does the council wish to s establish a commission whose job it would be to take all of the information we presented and talked about today, all the information from the work group, and sort of start anew? Um, I think that would, that would, a lot of this work is already done, and so maybe there's some, some in between. Um, and then option C is not one of these things. That's why I put a bunch of boxes. There's other things to consider. Uh, do you want to maintain the status quo for some sort of maintenance funding for nonprofits? Do you want to establish a larger multi-year funding pool for, for fund, uh, priority funding areas with a sort of a new source of money? Do you, would you like to make the process changes? I think the answer is probably yes to the process changes that have been recommended, like diversifying our, our uh, technical assistance and um, getting more outside help, ensuring we're getting feedback from constituents who receive nonprofits. Um, addressing arts and culture at the very least separately, we've heard really consistently over the last five years the need to do that. Um, and then whether there's other steps or other things you all heard tonight. I guess I want to throw out another consideration because it's almost sounding like this is the city thinking of itself as a philanthropist. Mm -hmm. and, um, and is that typical for governments? And then what are the other philanthropies in the community doing that we, we could be supplementing instead of duplicating? I think there have been other communities where that collaboration, there's sort of a traditional funding collaborative around the sort of major funders. And I was going to say, and sometimes in smaller communities, but that's not true. Sometimes in really much bigger communities, there's that sort of shared information uh, about what funding priorities are, where the sort of strategic uh, priority funding areas are covered by the other um, sort of private, either community foundations or mm -hmm. major private donors in town. And the safety net programs are the ones that the, the city or local municipal government says they're going to support. Um, and so that's one way in which that sort of communication and uh, uh, collaboration has occurred in the past. I think we'd be starting pretty fresh. I mean, Mr. Murphy convened a group of folks uh, three years ago um, of a bunch of local funders to sort of talk about could we agree on what community metrics of well-being are and what we want to collectively pay attention to. And there was a lot of interest in it, but very little capacity to um, commit to anything in that room. So, 
And just community foundation keeps coming up. Obviously, they have a model. I'm just trying to understand how we can better partner and leverage. I mean, we want we need to be like you said separate. There's there's different kind of goals that they have and different sources, of, and we have a different responsibility. I'm just trying to understand this. If we look at this more holistically, how how do they become part of this equation even for us? Because they have so many of the resources that are, are focused on just about the process and um, the way that they look at things. And again, we have a different lens. I'm just trying to understand like how we can better leverage that relationship. I think it would be worth asking them that question too. Um, but I, I mean, having been in the community meeting that CNE held, there were I heard at least an, uh, two or three uh, nonprofit folks who were saying, why doesn't the city just give the pool of money to the community foundation and let them run it? Mm -mm. I and heard so, that, yeah. Right. And so that is both a really beautiful, simple solution and and also really unpalatable on a number of fronts in both both directions. And so I think there's there's conversation to be had about what that would look like to benefit from expertise um, and including uh, process from them. And But probably it's more about sharing information mm -hmm. um, so that we can make sure that particularly if there are safety net gaps um, or our priority areas aren't being addressed elsewhere that we find a way to. Yeah, I, obviously I don't know. The county's another group too. Yeah. Agreed. And the county is anxious to see what we come up with, mm -hmm. I think, um, and whether they might be interested in sort of repartnering with us. But at the same time, their sense of the need for a revision was um, less uh, charged. Yeah. And that's one thing you have to be careful about is who is in charge. The delivery won't be the same. Mm -hmm. And maybe the, um, and I don't know what um, CACF is doing. I mean, I have had a meeting in terms of, you know, and had some brief conversations, but I haven't, um, and I know that sh they are just shifting. Mm -hmm. So this is new for them, mm -hmm. um, according to the conversation that I had with Brennan and what they are doing now. So it's fairly new, mm -hmm. um, too. Um, but the city has already been acting in the role um, of as, land yes mm -hmm. um, so it's not this isn't new it's just you providing more oversight for the money that you're giving away versus um, or attempting to or in attempting to focus on the impacts not just saying here you go but making sure that um, not that the needle is being moved but Whatever the magic alternative is. That the needles be in love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess what, what would be your thoughts about what Mr. Haneke was recommending to have a, a, an outside independent uh, group come in and do more uh, in-depth evaluation based on data and getting a more depth survey of, of what the community wants in terms of um, you know, capacity building, startup, operations of priority areas, that sort of thing. I, mean, I think we, we have done a lot of uh, looking at what has been in the past, and so I think I would be interested in understanding the sort of community feedback piece in a significantly sort of more robust way, but more about somebody who would help us design a potential mm -hmm. solution as opposed to somebody who would evaluate the past one, but co sort of taking all the constituents together and saying really prospectively designing, if we're going to listen to the community's needs and we have all of the constraints and tensions identified, what would, it, what would um, some smarty pants consultant tell us uh, to do um, moving forward? I think there's, that's wor that's, that sort of combination is worthy of the effort. I will say the last time that you all had asked for sort of rough estimates for what it would cost to do like a, a needs assessment to get to community needs and the last time we did one that was scientifically uh, uh, sound uh, was uh, $65,000 and that was a phone survey and I would imagine a phone survey would miss out some of the constituents that were really actively mm -hmm. interested in engaging and so that would include uh, additional face-to-faces and focus groups and using sort of trusted community allies to get access to people and their opinions, probably including paying people for their uh, information and lived experience and opinions and time. And so I'm thinking that's $100,000 to get to that without getting to something that's about design, right? So I'm just, there's. That just was painful for me. I know, I knew it would be. <laughs> So one thing that um, 
is always baffling for me is the amount of data that we collect in this community that every time we start to do something we are we start the discussion of that we need more data more mm -hmm. that can't be true well it's one way Very to mitigate true. risk right is to keep is to keep finding more data hoping that there'll, there'll be a really great answer that's embedded in the data but. so we're gonna have public comment at the end I think that there's two questions right uh, mm -hmm. one is uh, uh, it, where does the data come from uh, is it representative um, and uh, it, it is about the outcome right uh, and so I don't know if you want to base it just on the impacts if what I think council has been hearing uh, is that the other thing about we already know the impacts I think that's okay that's the one piece but the question is what solutions do the people who receive the service think would work for them you know and can there be consumer driven uh, decisions about uh, what gets delivered because I think we we tend to say this based on the problem is the practice we should implement yes. instead of asking folks what would help you we know pick whatever community problem you like uh, is the issue and we talk to people who are affected by that or do we say ah we take program X whenever we hear that this is the problem right so I mean th that's the shift I think in the strategy so maybe we already know what the all of the community problems are mm -hmm. and we don't have to go deeper to figure out what that is mm -hmm. but I don't think we have rich data from the people uh, who are experiencing that problem and and asking them what would have helped them to fix it we don't have the space to share that in my opinion oftentimes when these conversations are had they're being led by white people talking about issues that black people have mm -hmm. I hear you, but the alternative is to do what's always been done and say, we know what the solution is, right? So yeah. we, I'm not we, saying we have to do better at, at getting there then. Yeah, but we, we, we have to figure out how we can have space to have these, these discussions and solutions amongst ourselves, not with advocates, with all due respect, not with people who like say, like, I'm going to champion this issue for you but like we have our own advocates we have our own solutions but there's a disconnect in terms of us having our solutions being brought forth and then not being monopolized and there it is that may not be popular but what would next steps that. be to get that done started done three months two one <laughs> can you say get that can you so we were gonna if we were gonna hire a consultant or whatever the process would be to collect the um, data from the client perspective on what the solutions should be for let's say housing right education whatever the topics are I mean how do we even come up with what we're gonna present like what's next steps um, any one specific topic yeah, because okay. that's going to help we need the data to help drive what our power I'm just confused the order of operations you're saying. no I think if we're talking about the may we know the major issues that are in the community so what Mike I think I heard you just say that I agree with so hopefully is what you said is <laughs> that if we then say these are the issues that have been identified for the past 50 years in our community um, what do you think the solutions to those issues should be? So based on the data we already have. Yeah, okay. But, so, I would yeah, like to hear. So, I want to combine what, what I said, the mayor said, and what Dr. Bellamy has said, right? Uh, so, uh, we, we can imagine, I do believe, what we know about the community problems and what we've typically funded and what other people have typically funded, right? Um, 
uh, regardless of whether there's groups that exist to deliver it today. Um, I think that the, the key thing is who is going out and how to get the next data, right? And who uh, can, you know, be trusted, uh, you know, partners with the access to do it. I think that's what I hear from Wes. So, um, and, and so I, I turn that question back to Dr. Bellamy about uh, what's the timeline and process and how do we work uh, either with staff uh, or your existing group to give them whatever resources they need to make that happen. I can answer. Are you thinking? Were you about to? S I know that look. So like, there's something about to come out. So were you about to say something? <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, that means you're thinking. So I didn't want to. Mm. All right, cool. So, a couple of things in response to that. One, the nonprofit leaders of color group. I think that we could uh, maybe bring one of um, staff members to the meeting. Well, I'll talk to them about that first. Um, but I think it would be beneficial for one of the city staff members to come to the meeting. And then uh, I think we can work develop, work together in regards to developing um, a plan and or timeline. One in that plan being, okay, exactly what you just said. What resources do you need? I know there's a connection with CACF from the nonprofit leaders of color and they're willing to support us in a wide variety of different ways. But what resources do you need from the city? Um, and then how can that group be a conduit to get to to have these conversations that we want to have, provide these safe spaces that we're looking at having. And I think it doesn't always have to be like, if we want to have these discussions or if we want to figure out exactly who these entities are who want to get the funding but can't or whatever, it doesn't always have to be city-led. Like we have other groups and organizations who are doing the work who could be our liaisons for hosting these convenings so that people can feel comfortable and feel safe in regards to being open but also coming and getting the help that's needed. A timeline for that, I mean, we meet, um, again, the first Wednesday of every month. Uh, we can have this in three, six months, but if we're looking at a consultant as well, uh, I think conferring with that group, since it is the only group in the area that consists mainly of uh, just non specifically nonprofit leaders of colors, consulting with that group and asking them, all right, well, would you like to be involved in the interview process? Um, is there anyone here who could uh, possibly come out as the consultant? Like, it's things like that in which we can work on. So I have um, just a thought about, so if we were gonna do a, um, sort like needs assessment is that what you're like a community-wide because we discussed yeah I think that we I, I think we have data that that we can read that tells us according to the data like what the community needs are I think the question is yeah. is the solution that we traditionally go to to address that need is that the thing that is also the safe and welcoming place for people who are traditionally left out is it also is it the place that has the stickiness is yeah. it a place that reflects the the consumers when both needs and and that the sort of as what Wes is describing this capacity to be both vulnerable and open and honest in a context so it's not just about you're getting a prescribed service that we know works for you but but it's done all of the things are done in a way that it make it sticky mm -hmm. um, and yeah. so that's what I think the question on the table is not necessarily the need but how do you how should we solve this problem how do you think we should solve this problem yes yeah and so I think so um, Wes one of the um, what I was just thinking when you were talking when last year right when we were um, San Barreras when we were talking about the funding for them um, it would became clear that they weren't being necessarily served well to by other non you know other nonprofits or according so this is when you're talking about any group um, and especially you know low income groups we have to I, I think that that is I know that was my experience when I was involved in nonprofits so then we're talking about how to reach those groups and who do we use to right. to reach mm -hmm. um, because I don't know if this group would go to the Hispanic communities 
and um, do their assessment, right? So I, I mean, that's part of mm -hmm. what I, th I think we should evaluate as what next steps are. I, I think Dr. Bellamy is identifying um, that he's a part of a group that I think oh, is, yeah. is a big part of the solution, but not inclusive of the right. entire solution. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so uh, no, I, I think that we would uh, look at- But I just at, don't want to leave out. That's absolutely, all. so I would mm -hmm. say that, you know, we would look at what we believe, because we have plenty of data, right, to tell us what the, mm -hmm. the need areas are, and what are the purpose areas of all the things that we've been funding or that people have been applying then for, and you go to the folks who are yeah. experiencing those issues, mm -hmm. and, and maybe even people who've successfully dealt with them, and say, what, what helped, yeah. right, or what would help you now, no. um, <laughs> and compare that, uh, I think, to some of the strategies that are being implemented, so and talk about how we might fund that. Yes. So, so just a thought in here. It's like there, there are two different things. One will be starting from saying, hey, there's a problem in the community that A, nobody is working on sufficiently, and B, that a nonprofit is the best, if, even if it doesn't exist yet, is the best entity to solve that problem. And that, to me, sounds like the path that we're going down. And I think that that is like very ambitious, but I, it, there's could also be a lot of problems with that because as opposed to saying one of the problems that Wes is bringing up, which is there might be lots of nonprofits out there that are small, that are working on issues in the community that are finding the government inaccessible or unappealing or not open to them. And so somebody has started who is disadvantaged or underrepresented a, a, a civic effort to try and work on a problem, but they're not being served in the same way that these big incumbent you know, people who know how ABRT works are, and what we need to do is open up the process to people. Because if, if we're getting in the business of starting to ask for new nonprofits to be started up that in a city of 50,000 people, that, that's like a whole other, like saying, say well, but, but that would be working forward from saying there's data, there's a problem in the community, so we would like But for existing nonprofits could say, hey, I have possibly have the skills to meet this need. They could apply for the funding. They could say we do this under other grant um, funding so streams that we get. I mean, there are other ways. We would have a back and forth where we would, I'm not saying this, but, but where we would say we think, okay, we've heard you. We now recommend that you, nonprofit, go and work on that community area. No, I think the group, hopefully we will, establish a priority setting committee, we would receive the applications. Um, from those applications, they'll be evaluated. Um, from those evaluations, uh, nonprofits will receive funding. We will have this outcome impact metrics established, um, and there will be a valuation um, process in place to start evaluating them after year one and then we would move forward from from there. Yeah. I, I think that ultimately it would lead you to say, from the city's perspective, these are the community problems we're trying to solve. We've been talking about priority areas for a long time, right? These are the problems we're trying to solve. We know from people facing these issues that these are some of the things they, they'd like to see delivered. And it may be that nonprofits will say, hey, we're gonna do this other part to get you there. But I think that what we might learn along the way is there, there's some things that we haven't funded because we're doing programming instead of what I'll call like connective tissue kind of services, right? And so um, we imagine that we're gonna deliver counseling uh, or uh, workforce development or a training program without uh, putting the funding behind the transportation or child care that would have made that thing happen for people and allowed them to be su successful at it. So that, that's what I think is the different layer of information you're gonna find out there. And I just have a question then so this commission will be the group that is charged with setting the priorities. And again, I'm looking at the examples, like for example, a safety net programming, self-sufficiency programming, or community livability programs. And what we've heard from the public already is that, for example, with arts, 
and culture that there was a feeling that there was a they were they were the round peg in the square hall that the arts and culture did not fit into the evaluation and metric outcomes that that are associated with say a safety net or a self-sufficiency program mm -hmm. so that's setting those priorities is really critical and um, again historically it's been the council will set priorities and then the, the strategic plan is used as to kind of guide the mm -hmm. the funding so how do we um, are we uh, is the implication that the arts funding might fall out of this Wh who decides that what so is, is it the Commission is the Commission then institutionalized a standing Commission that we'd have to establish by ordinance that's those kinds of things I'm, I'm just just grappling with uh, what is what is the vehicle to shift us away from the, the, the process we've got now and it's got challenges and issues with it for sure but I, I also don't want to lose sight of these important questions of logistically how do you implement a new direction with, that's governed by a commission that is not elected but appointed and is establishing priorities that could potentially change <coughs> every three yes, years or every five years, something like that. I think this group did, the work group did imagine this was a formal commission that was appointed. Okay. I think we, we talked about whether that's an annual consideration of priorities, which would um, could potentially shift the playing field a lot from year to year, which might be too frequent, mm -hmm. or a two or three year process in which you set priorities for a couple of years at a time. And we had imagined some, uh, the, what the makeup of that uh, group would, would be, um, and sort of the kinds of expertise or experience we would want um, to um, uh, on that commission. And that the commission would, after its appointment, be largely uh, independent of the, both the politics and the staffing uh, of the organization organization so that we would receive the feedback from them and that would then inform the way we move forward with our process and that and we could set uh, a sort of structure that says we would like four broad based categories uh, um, of funding priority areas or three or whatever and we would like to know what percentage you think based on what you've seen of our funding pool should go to this versus that versus this. Um, and, you know, if there, for example, one of the questions that can, has uh, sort of suggestions that the mayor has brought up a, a number of times is if there's, for example, during this sort of m massive phase of redevelopment, we have all of this redevelopment happening in the next five years, um, should, the, should the city be invested or investing in services for families who will be involved in that redevelopment process to increase the level of their stability and safety during this period of transition and, and chaos. And so those kinds of things might be a directive that the council says, this is something on our mind. We'd like you to actively consider this when you're, when you're chewing on the data and the priority setting. So I think we can, looking at some of the ways that other municipal governments have sort of made this definition, we could say we would like them to be broad, we'd like them to be narrow, we'd like them to be percentages, those kinds of things, and ask. And I, I think the, AB, the sort of arts and culture has successfully been part of nonprofit funding mechanisms in other communities. It's just not subject to the same evaluative rubric. And I think that's the, that's the question on the table is should that be moved out? In the same way for community coalitions or for collaborations or those things, should they be evaluated in a different um, sort of uh, set of expectations and that probably is not the same group that sets the priorities but so I think we you all need some direction Do that would be so nice so I just want to suggest that we do have all the data we need and that what we're missing is real people data. And I think that the idea of letting people who are actually going to be impacted by the services define the solutions is the game changer and the difference maker. And, uh, and I think that there could be a structure for that. And I, I want to point out two things. One, the, the university community working group. Excuse me. Um, 
Okay. Can you just say who you are for the folks? Oh, sorry, being er reported? Erica Vixilio. Yeah. I'm with the Fountain Fund and was part of the UVA community working group where we did a, a pretty broad community engagement session to identify priority areas. And the four that were identified aren't any surprise: affordable housing, uh, public health care, and edu early edu or education in general, and um, wages. thank you, jobs and wages. And so th th those were identified and I do wonder if we had people pointed in the same direction working on the same priority areas if we wouldn't be able to leverage more resources as was talked about before. But one of the key things that we recommended is that there are working groups made up of the people actually that would be receiving the benefit of any services and that are practitioners providing the services to decide what the solutions are rather than nonprofit executive directors and their boards. And so I, I hope that there can be consideration of not a consultant and not more data, but using the people of our community to help move us forward. Um, and also potentially linking with the work that was just done with the UVA Community Working Group. Also, I want to say that I think that there are many nonprofits that would love to do an equity assessment, but we don't necessarily have the resources. So one thing I wonder is if you would consider making it a requirement of people who receive city funding to do an equity assessment and use some of your equity funds, I think there's a set aside fund for that, to uh, support that. And so people wouldn't be evaluated uh, initially on how they're doing with that. It's not a condition of receiving funds, but it is a condition to have the assessment and then potentially going forward to improve their baseline of whatever happens in that assessment. I think everyone wants to be doing better than they're doing in that area. And then um, finally, one thing is getting back to the data. We do have lots of data. And one thing I was struck by is, do you all get a comprehensive report of what is in the, um, what we're submitting in terms of all the input that we are getting from the people that we're serving. I think that there are several nonprofits that are really leading the way in terms of making sure that the people who we're providing services to are informing the changes that we make in our services and, and our, uh, how people are pleased with our services. I mean, it would be great to have a Batten student or an MPH student where you can have the same person over and over come up with a methodology for aggregating all that data so you have an impact report about what's happening because I feel like part of what we're hearing is that we're not seeing the impact. And while there can be bigger and maybe deeper impact, there is impact now. And so I think that that would be a great student project. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? I think it's been a really productive conversation. Um, I wanted to um, agree with what Dr. Bellamy said at the very end there that I, I really think that it's important to shift the, the power dimensions of how we think about this. Um, I'm a white liberal and I think most of the nonprofit community in Charlottesville is made up of white liberals. And um, I think white liberals are pretty well, a lot of them are well intentioned, but we don't see what we don't see because of our perspective and our point of view, and I think that's part of the problem that we're talking about here today. Um, I've brought this up before when the, when the disproportionate minority contact, juvenile contact with, um, the, with the justice system was doing their work, um, and Dave, Dave Chapman can verify this with you. Um, my recommendation was that you think really careful, carefully about how you hire consultants, because we tend to go to the same well for consultants, and they have the, the, this traditional white liberal perspective as well. At that time, at, at that, during that commission process, I encouraged them to hire consultants that um, are expert in critical race theory, sociology, um, and the kinds of things that we're talking about that don't get discussed here or looked at here. So I think um, the suggestion that Dr. Bellamy made um, about including the um, uh, nonprofit leaders of color in the design process is right on the money because I think that's where this sort of um, this sort of starts um, uh, to change and and I think it's a it's a it's a game changer as well. So um, as I sat here and listened, uh, there's for me and I hate to complicate things, but I felt like there's a bigger problem than just the ABRT process, and I don't mean to say the solution should never be well we need to do another study. That's not, what, that's not what I was talking about at the beginning. We don't need to do another study. I think um, the city manager, acting city manager, hit it on the head when he said, 
we should be studying, we should be focusing on the solutions at this point and the actions that go with the solutions. Um, but I have to say, listening to this conversation, I was taking a 5,000 foot perspective and I don't just think it's the nonprofits in town. I think when you start doing this kind of work, you should include um, city departments that provide direct services. Um, I don't think we've had enough of a discussion about the relationship between the city service providers and the nonprofit providers and the interactions and the problems that I think a lot mm -hmm. of our citizens I, uh, encounter with city service providers. I'm thinking about Child Protective Services and, and other uh, agencies like that. They need to be included in this review as well. Um, I think, again, from a 5,000 foot perspective and thinking about what Dr. Mellaby has said in terms of changing the perspective, I think we need to like take a, a 5,000 foot perspective where we talk about these services um, as well as things like city decision making processes. Again, um, as the last speaker said, client perspectives have to be front and center. Um, the entire review process has to be a part of this data collection and how data is collected has to be a, pro a part of this. And then the last part that came up that I thought was really important was you've got to figure out some way to build capacity for writing grants and I mean there should be a separate fund or a separate consultant or something where folks get access to those kinds of resources because I think what we're not asking is which of these nonprofits can raise funds independently and which can't. And I think once you start divvying up those nonprofits into their capacity to raise external funds versus their lack of capacity to raise external funds, you're talking about an equity issue that um, is pervasive through this entire, entire process. Um, uh, just a couple last things. I mean, we're dealing with equity and accountability here. I think it's really important to figure out how our money is being spent, and I think a cost-benefit approach needs to be taken, like are the benefits of nonprofit and city services outweighing the costs? And how do those costs weigh in? Um, I think that has to, um, that has to um, be a part of this. Um, I'm not quite sure we do have enough data. Maybe I'm wrong and maybe you have it. So if you do, I hope you share it. And that is, we need to know how many nonprofits there are in Charlottesville. They need to be category, categorized in terms of what kinds of services they do. Um, we have to, uh, we need to determine the racial demographics of executive directors and boards as well as clients because I don't know that, maybe you have that data, but I'd like to know what the racial demographics for executive directors, uh, boards, uh, 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 advisory boards and clients look like. Um, a couple last points, I think we're depending, we're depending right now on an outreach and engagement process that is completely broken. And I don't know, I mean, we've had this, I've been here 23 years, and we've had this discussion over and over and over again about your inability to access input and information from low-income communities. And that problem just keeps coming up and cycling and cycling. I know you have a consultant that you've hired to deal with it, but I don't think it's solving the problem. So you I think we need to take a different point of view because we're not getting, the kind of data that we're getting from CNE and from the city that's presented uh, today, I think is um, evidence of the problem. So again, going back to Dr. Bellamy's idea of the nonprofit leaders of um, color, they should be integrally involved in designing whatever data collection or evaluation or needs assessment or problem addressing system that, um, that, um, that, um, is, that you consider. There's a statement in this PowerPoint where it says self-selecting feedback um, leads to incomplete picture of impact and I think that's exactly what we're dealing with here. The data is about self-selection and uh, people are self-selecting into surveys, people are self-selecting into focus groups, who's choosing the focus groups, who's in those focus groups. Um, we can't rely on self-report data. Um, we need to dig deeper on the methodology for the way we, we do things here. Lastly, and this is honestly the last thing I'm gonna say, <laughs> is we are in a post-2017 world and that's the social context of the work that we're doing here can't forget that. Sometimes we just rush right back into old forms of discussions. You are addressing problems that were hidden and uh, ignored for decades and centuries that are manifest in different areas. 
The council has done a great job at making um, a priority for affordable housing in this, in this community. They're working on the um, Civilian Review Board. I think this issue right here is a third part of the triangle of addressing the inequality and the inequities in this community that have been, um, that have, we've shown a light on since 2017. So I really appreciate all the work that everyone in this room and up there has been uh, doing because I think this is a really, really important response to the white nationalists and the Nazis and the racists that came to town. And then the racism that we've had just for decades in town. I think this is a way, uh, this is one of the triangles, uh, tripods of policy that you can actually address and make significant changes so that when people come back in next summer, it's coming up in three months, the media is going to come back, everyone's going to come back and they're going to say, what is different about Charlottesville after 2017? And I think you're going to be able to tell them, We've done a pretty good job at dealing with affordable housing inequity. We're working on a s civilian review board inequity, and we're really looking at transforming the way that we equitably disperse funds to our nonprofits and our social services. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? I'm afraid I have to go. All right. I just have a quick question for Kaki. In when you were doing the research with the other communities, was there? Um, you mentioned the caps on funding, like the different amounts. Was there a precedent for um, a cap on the percentage of an organization's budget that they might apply for when applying for ABRT funding? I didn't see that, but that, that might be something that's built in. I know that that's, a, that's always been a question in our, in our ABRT process, what percentage of, the, of your overall budget uh, constitute, is constituted by ABRT funds. Um, and it's generally really, I mean, there's, there are notable exceptions, but it's generally less than 10% um, historically for ABRT. So, um, but I, I did not see another community, but I also wasn't looking for that. So it, it, may, it may exist out there. I just didn't happen to bump into it. Is there anyone else? Okay. Close in public um, comment. So we know you want direction, but obviously given timing, I'm wondering if I've heard that our next agenda might be a little light. Maybe we could just... A city council agenda will be light? Uh, that's what I heard. It's the rumor. Um, I'm just, I just want us to have a chance to digest and then have... I, I, do, I feel like you need direction, but I don't think we can give direction at this moment. Agreed. Okay. And I think there's a lot to chew on, so I yeah, think that's, yeah. that's... So I'm just trying to figure out what is the next opportunity. I can't wait I mean, I to come to council. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be it. I'm just saying we need to find another opportunity. That's but I think we need, to, we, we need to give some direction fairly quickly. And I'm not interested in another year of just freezing funding either. So um, I don't know what staff would recommend um, outside, of, outside of that. But um, what do you think in terms of talking about this on... Um, the 20th? I don't even know what day it is. The 20th? May 20th mm -hmm. uh, and June 17th are good possibilities. June 3rd is a little more mm -hmm. crowded. Mm -hmm. So could we do it the next meeting? Uh, I mean, it's if council nothing, feels yeah, it's like enough. you've heard enough and that uh, Kaki feels like we can turn it around that way, then... I don't see it being a... I mean, I feel like... Tonight we were going to try to do it in 10 minutes. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to be 10 minutes, but I'm hopeful that we can understand like what directionally next steps. We're not going to solve all this in the next council meeting. I'm pretty convinced. But I'd I be think, really impressed. If you but did. just for like these options going forward, what hybrid of this are we looking at? Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that we can do that. That would be great. Okay. We can decide whether we're going to establish yeah. the priority committee mm -hmm. in terms of arts. What I heard is that maybe there needs to be a new application. So Separate. that's if you all could maybe bring some information to us so what that would look like um how would it look differently but i know that we would be creating a new application overall so um I, i'm going to send you all the richmond application just because I, the more i go back to it the more it answers a lot of the questions okay. that we have posed and so just in that's pretty far down the road in terms mm -hmm. of process to think about the application but it does address some of those questions that we had uh the tension questions that are posed that mm -hmm. are it's worth thinking about. Right. And um, Wes, could you all have a discussion before that next meeting? Yep, I already sent them an email. And um, attend, plan to attend the group? 
members maybe can plan to attend the meeting? The city council meeting? Mm -hmm. Yep. Madam Mayor, just a question, like if we were to basically pass a pass a resolution, so we have a new city manager coming on, which is a big deal in terms of a lot of the pri big pri you know, priorities, budget setting, engagement with council, stakeholder engagement, all kind of stuff we're talking about, strategic vision. So if we were to tell him and his lead team to listen to this discussion and come back with a recommendation to us, you know, sometimes we do that. Come back with, or come back with two or three options for what council would do. Would it, wh how would it differ from where we are right now? Like one is a priority setting commission. I, I could imagine that you could argue that that's duplicative with what we do before budget season anyway. We do heavy engagement on all these, well, if I could just finish, with, with, with all these different areas where we're gonna spend lots of money, try to solve lots of problems, engage with lots of things in the community, and you could just put the part, the, the gap in our community that nonprofits solve into that regular system and say, we, we just want to embed this in our earlier rather than having it come up later. So when we start working on the part of our problems that we fund and solve with nonprofits, that happens in the fall, you know, before every budget cycle. And so we don't, and, and nonprofit, I mean, I'm, I'm asking what would the city manager come back to us with as recommendations for how we. And just to clarify the priority setting commission, this is saying based on all the data that you have, we have throughout the city, CACF is doing um, this based on what, right, the conversation that I had. They are looking at focus areas and funding them for longer periods of time now. So this is different from how we've been doing it and we would need to decide this pool of money, what areas will it be spent on? And then the I'm, I'm a little concerned about how powerful such a commission could be. But it's not context. based on necessarily, it, if we're doing this right, it's based on what the community is saying the needs and the solution, based on the needs, what the solutions are. Well, perhaps, but I mean, if it's, if it's seven or eight members who are making a decision who have kind of a lot of power over how a couple but this million would dollars. Always if come I could just finish, I'm, I'm not interrupting anybody else. I'm just trying to finish my. But I don't think you understand, so I'm trying to help you. Well, b can I? You do that without interrupting me. Knock yourself out. Okay. So what I was saying is that I am concerned about the power that could accumulate to a very small group of people that has a lot of authority over how a few million dollars are spent. I'm concerned about that. So currently there is a group and they make recommendations and then we get them and that we evaluate them during the nonprofit budget session. So we would still do that part. So But this sounds more strategic. This isn't based on applications from like right now it's driven by the applicants. We will get those applications in. The only difference is that we will set funding priorities based on what the community, um, in terms of, maybe I'm not getting it. I, I, would just, I, gotta, I gotta go run and get the kids from the Boys and Girls yeah. Club before 6.30, so like, uh, I'm just I, I would just say, and we could certainly address this on the 20th, uh, but I think that the, the primary difference is that there, there would be this group, they might be prepared differently or spend more time than the ABRT does now. It would still go through the city manager and then back to council for approval. The, the question is, um, would you be more targeted uh, uh, in saying what impacts you're looking for uh, and what measurements will constitute uh, that uh, impact, right? Uh, and the current system today uh, allows people to apply for any number of things and maybe get like, four points um, for addressing a priority. You might shift how much the priorities are worth or say you don't apply if you don't uh, meet a priority. And you might also say after some serious uh, thought on what this application looks like um, that 
this is the measurement we require instead of allowing the applicant to say, here's how I'm going to measure that I meet your impact. And the priority setting group is just setting priorities. There's still another process that follows around how people apply towards those priorities. I just want to make that clear because I hear you're giving power, we're giving too much power, but it still is around the, the focus areas uh, only. They're um, not designing the priority areas that then are originating what the funding requests are. That, that's what I was hearing. Uh, yeah, I think you are the owner of saying <coughs> what the priorities are. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the group is the owner of whatever the new evaluative process is. Mm, no, no. That didn't sound like that. No, so what we um, I g imagined was the priority setting group would look at the data. I hope that we, part of that process would be telling us how they arrived at the priorities. Yes, but um, you all still have to endorse that yes. those are the priorities. Yes. Is my but, point. But we'll You're get the that. owner. Yes, but we'll get that report. Yes. So we had like stepping stones, that was a report. Yeah, that, we have a whole um, list of we, Yeah, so we looked at, and this is where we realized when we came back to council that we needed more people involved in the process, um, that you know there was some feedback uh, from the nonprofit community that we, about us in particular, the group that I convened setting the priorities. And so this is about looking at, which we never intended to do, just want to say that, <laughs> um, but ma making sure that, um, you know, it was that whoever is doing this is looking at all the data sources that we already um, have with, out in the community. And we talked about possibly the community-wide needs assessment or. And, and so we, we did talk, I mean, I think you all can, can dictate that to the priority setting group, right? And so you can have this external yep. group that can review the data and you can say, what we'd like is your top, what you think are the top three to five um, unmet needs or the top three to five emerging needs or priority needs. You could also say, we want you to tell us based on what you've seen, what percentage of our money should go to safety net programming versus um, quality of life programming versus self-sufficiency programming. You can, we can ask the priority setting group to, to do something a little less broad than saying, look at all the data and tell us what we should fund. So see, right? I think you all can dictate that. Th this is helping me. And especially, and I'm gonna miss the, I'm not gonna be here for the 20th meeting. So it's a, I appreciate the opportunity. Now, as, as long as there's a feedback loop between yeah. council and the priorities of this commission and and it sort of sounds like it's mirroring the CIP process or others where you have, you have opportunities for council to not just be delivered this package of up or down recommendations at the end where there really would be a lot of power with this, mm -hmm. but that we are weighed in with in a way that's respectful of our time and so on and like the other, then I think that th that sounds better. You can dictate the charge. Sure. And you can then confirm yeah, the recommendations, it, yeah. and then you can evaluate the, the feedback. And I think one of the things we heard most consistently tonight is to make sure that whatever they're doing, reviewing data, is, in, is placing a huge amount of priority on getting constituent uh, feedback on uh, their needs and doing it in a way that is really uh, robust and comprehensive enough to actually have some meaning and, and give uh, life to some voices that don't traditionally get heard. Okay, thank you. And I think that I did think that, this, that we had enough skills within <laughs> the group to at least present counsel based on looking at the data what um, maybe some of the top fo focus areas should be. I just want to correct that. What I just said. I think we probably do. I think we all, yeah. there's also some benefit to having it be external. Um, oh no, I'm just saying my purposes. thinking yeah. as I said it. Okay. I thought a different thought, so oh, I, I wanted to share. Okay. And okay. council would appoint this commission like others. This would be a stand. They'd have terms, yep. and we would yep. they'd be foyable and like a real standing. Yep. Okay. I think I would appoint them all. 
<laughs> we, I will say that we identified, and I can't remember, we identified somebody who would have data experience, somebody who had um, experience, at several people who had been recipients of local nonprofit yes. services, people who had worked and experience in mid-range, small, mid-range, and large nonprofits. I think we had a 12-member commission, and we had imagined what kinds of expertises and experience we would expect to be on that, and we felt like that was a fairly balanced group of folks. And then from that, the council would say, these are the individuals who sort have of applied for that slot, and we'd like to appoint them. But we did envision that this would be more of a multi-year recommendation because every year it would just be too much churn. And so this group might go stagnant or you know, have a pause because this is not something that's going to be continually met. But there's going to be some work that's done in a period of time to get to those priorities, and then we really should be living with those priorities unless there's some major shift. Otherwise, I think we set up another false expectation that we're going to be able to have impact that we can't have. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, can you include that? Because I think we gave that information before, right? Yep. Share. So can yep. we get that on the... As whatever. part of the memo or whatever? Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. And we're trying to create a bunch of work because we know, I mean, we have this so much. This is really important, I think. We but I'm saying this information is already there. I hope we're not creating a bunch of new work for this t 10 days out. I'm just, I think we have the information. I'm just apologizing. Oh, Mike didn't mind. He winked at me. <sighs> <laughs> I'm talking to Kat. This person is going to do the work. You can good. sign her up. <laughs> thank you. All right. Hey, you're up. <laughs> all right. So thank you all. Thank you. And um, uh, thank you all for staying um, an extra 27 minutes and uh, meeting adjourned.